you so much for that welcome. And we're both very happy to be here to present this topic today at OWASP APSAC. Like um, previously introduced, my name is Megan and I'm here with Uma and we're gonna be presenting practical threat modeling for real world and cloud situations in our hybrid and work from home world. So to take you through, we have a little bit of an agenda. We'll be doing introductions and then we'll go over how to threat model with examples. And then we will be doing some actual practicing with threat modeling. So Uma will be taking us through that. And then we'll go through some questions and answers. So whatever questions you might have, please feel free to submit those through the Hula app and we'll be going through those. So who am I? Well, I have had a variety of different experiences in technology. Um, I have about 10 years of IT experience um, and a little bit more than that. And I have a bachelor's in cybersecurity with a focus on network system administration and a master's in leadership. And I've done just, you know, variety of different things, be it um, exploring, building with electronics, um, threat intelligence, risk assessment. So right now I'm doing um, threat intelligence and tremendously enjoying that. I think it's so important that we recognize that we are not an island and we didn't get here just by doing one thing or meeting one person or um, connecting with one group. And so I'm fairly involved with the information security community and in a number of organizations, both as a mentor and as someone who believes in constantly learning as a mentee as well. In fact, Uma and I actually met through Cloud Security Alliance, the Washington DC chapter, and um, she runs the operations and I, help, and I help provide some support with that. I also love to investigate research. So I'm a research advisory board member for breaking barriers in cybersecurity. And then I love to travel. So I've been to all the states in the United States, several of the territories, and I'd like to go to all the continents one day. I'm about halfway there. And I also do some podcasting about AI ethics, research in artificial intelligence and emerging technology and data loss prevention. And I will turn it over to Uma to share about herself. All right, hopefully you are able to see my screen. Um, good. Thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you, moderator. Hello, everyone, and thanks for attending our webinar today. My name is Umara Jagopal. I have 20 plus years of IT experience. I came to this country for about uh, 1998 in O2K projects. In the past decade, I've been mostly focused on information security, compliance, and third party assessments. Um, I have completed master's in cybersecurity and information assurance. Here are some uh, uh, industry certifications I have taken uh, over the year. Facts about me, uh, being a mentor at various uh, cybersecurity platforms, so it's very critical to give back and very critical to make sure um, the people who wants to get into, break into cybersecurity, get the guidance they need. So please feel free to uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, but we'll see where we can uh, get there. If you catch me reading any books or um, uh, looking at a YouTube videos or podcasts, mostly it is going to be on cyber in the recent years. Um, I've been a board member for Cloud Security Alliance, Washington, D.C. chapter. We run monthly webinars. Uh, please check us out. And I also co-authored the Zero Trust Architecture for uh, the, the DC chapter uh, research team. Also check it out, it is up and on our website. One fun fact about me um, is I climbed the Mount Himalayas uh, prior to pandemic and it was a quite an experience. All right, let's get into the meat of uh, this presentation. What is threat modeling? There is one card that comes to my mind when we talk about threat modeling. This is none other, This is said by none other than our uh, key North speaker today, Adam. He says, threat modeling is a fancy name for something we do instinctively. I love this card. Here is why. Imagine you want to go for a walk. What would you do? You would do a quick health check to make sure um, you are good to go, you are comfortable going for a walk, and uh, you don't have any pains. 
you will also check weather to make sure it's not raining or it's not super cold or hot. Accordingly, you will take things that will help you. You also will grab phones or headset, possibly take water and little snacks if it is longer walk. You are going to let the people know uh, who's living with you so that they don't have to worry about uh, when you're stepping away. And you also use a known path. What did you just do? You just did a threat modeling subconsciously. You looked at what you want to do and what could go wrong and what you can do to mitigate them. Or if there is something that you can accept the risk, you would accept the risk and move on. For example, you take the phone in the event something happens, it's kind of alerting mechanism where you're able to reach someone for help. Likewise, water, your performance, you don't want to get your performance affected. So you would take water or snack to make sure you can go. Your availability of doing this is not affected. So this is why things that we instinctively think about, what the threat is, does it apply to me? If it does, what can we do to control? So I'm going to uh, get back to Megan, who is going to, take us us through what the threat modelings and why and how we do it. And I will circle back with the practical life example that we all can do it together. Back to you, Megan. Thank you, Uma. Okay, so Uma just took us through a very real world example that is something that, you know, hopefully we're, we're going outside, at least where we are on the East Coast here. It's been a lovely weather week. Um, the leaves are falling um, and, you know, you can kind of think about planning and how that is going to relate to threat modeling and something you might do instinctively, right? So everyone can kind of place themselves literally into those shoes. So another thing that we might think about is how many things changed during this past year and into 2021 as well. Um, it, so work in 2019 and then March in 2020, um, huge changes for a lot of people. And some of you might not have had any changes depending on what you do. It might be that your work always was work from home and it continued that way. But others of you, it might be that you now do work from home and you don't have a return date. I have a number of our friends who work in government positions and they don't have a specific return to office date. And so you have to make a number of adjustments and think through what are different things that changed when those changes happen. And as you think through those changes, you might think about, well, at first, you know, I just started working at home and I had maybe some bandwidth issues and I had to change that. And maybe I had, um, you know, work documents that I had out or I had my screen open and maybe was on a call and a family member was home and maybe some of that information was sensitive and shouldn't have been heard. And so you have to start thinking about like maybe my workplaces actually changed and where you work changed from home as the progression of work from home changed. And so those are ways that work from home threat modeling might have happened where you might have actually instinctively changed things as you were iteratively trying what works and what doesn't work for my specific situation. And so as you can kind of think through, like, did you change things? What has changed? How have those changes happened? Um, those would be some of the ways that you might have gone through. Um, other things that might have happened, you know, when you were in an office, you might have had a whole team that was devoted to pushing updates and making sure that everything that you were doing um, was fully patched and that they were checking all those different things ahead of time. Um, and, and you know, maybe you saw a couple of weeks ago with the um, with NPM that you know, oh, hey, I do some work with that, 
and I need to actually now do a self check at home. What version do I have of this? And so you might be doing at home more self checks of your technology than you did because you might be mixing different things in a way that you weren't with your at home network. Maybe you are isolating things in a different way as well too. So all of these are things that you might be thinking through um, and changes that you might just be making very, very instinctively. So we've gone through um, an example of just being able to go for a walk, um, of thinking through changes that might have made that you might have made um, because of circumstances that happen um, globally. And hopefully, you know, you're at this talk, the, the talk title caught your eye. Hopefully you think maybe threat modeling should exist and it should be something that one does and, and maybe it's part of the work that you do. So we're gonna just quickly go through why we should threat model. And this could also be something that you take back to your team if it's not something that you are currently doing and something that you want to have added to your systems and designs. So one of the reasons is that it does promote a security culture in your practices um, and design practices and really trying to make sure that within that security culture that you're shifting security left. Um, it, that you are making sure that you're trying to design things and think about things in a very proactive manner um, and thinking about things from the design life cycle. And if you're able to come up with, oh, this could be an issue and fix that configuration prior to it being an issue, that is going to cost much less money in the long run. Now, it could be that you as a team are not currently threat modeling. You already have some things in production. So that's perfectly fine. It is okay to add in threat modeling if you don't already have it. And so some of the reasons you might want to do that are because when in production but not already shipped, um, it, it can allow you to think through hey, these might be some problems that might occur um, that an attacker might find. And so same thing, you would be able to save from a cost perspective. And then because you're working across different teams, and we'll, I'll talk through this a little bit later, and I know Uma will also discuss this when she goes through her example, you can really see how it can build teamwork because you're all working together to make the systems, the things that you design more secure. And so it's, it's with a very um, defenders-based approach, um, really thinking through, you know, okay, these are maybe some things that could go wrong, but how do we fix it? How do we get to that before it would happen? Um, to go back to Uma's example earlier, you know, you think about when you're going to go for a walk and you check the weather. If you see it's a high likelihood of rain, you bring that umbrella. Sometimes you don't even need the umbrella, but the fact that you have it, right, you've done that preparation, you've been proactive. And so that's what a lot of this is about. And then you think about how then as a team, you're all helping each other. And then that builds that team culture and collaboration. So we've gone through some examples. We've gone through why we do it. Now let's actually get into some of the how and engaging with it. So I'm first gonna be very, very broad with this. And then I'm going to go into some specific examples. So broad and then narrow. So it's not that there's any one single right way or one approach to do this. But what we're gonna do today is go through a generalized framework and then go through stages that can be placed within this framework and then also give some examples. So one place to start is what exactly are you working on? You know, what projects 
are these? What systems are you building? What, what are different things are you working on? What can go wrong? Which that question in itself can be kind of an overwhelming question. And so asking it can be a brave thing to do, but it's a very, and it's a very important thing to do as well. Okay, you've thought through, these are the things that can go wrong. And now maybe you're a little bit, you know, nervous about those things. Um, this is where this additional proactive piece comes in that I really enjoy because you're really trying to make it actionable. What are you going to do about it? What are the steps that you're going to take? What are they going to be? Okay, you found that there is potential for cross-site scripting to occur. What are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna harden the systems? How are you going to mitigate that? Um, hopefully you're not just going to say, yes, we accept that risk. <laughs> so what are you gonna do about it? And, and that's the thing that I love because you, know, you can work with the different teams and actually make those systems better and fix them. And then, you know, with any changes you make, you need to figure out, was that actually effective? Did it work? You know, we, we came up with this plan to do this thing. We had a project manager on it. We tracked it. We thought it happened. Did it work? Did it do the thing? And so it becomes iterative, right? Um, and so we'll go through a couple different models. So these are all, like I said before, there's not one right one, um, but you can kind of see with these different models. And then we'll go back out to another big picture example. But you can see with these different models that you can take threat modeling and really apply it in different ways depending on which projects you're working on. So being that we're at the OWASP conference, we thought it would be interesting to go through some different threat models and connect them with some of the OWASP top 10 um, from 2021. So one of the models, and we'll come back to this one later, is STRIDE. And so this is a caustic acronym. And so you can see it defined out. So we have spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And so what do all those things sound like, right? These are all threats that could occur. And so broad categories of threats. And you're trying to analyze, you know, what could go wrong and then come up with your strategy after that. And so within a couple of these, thought through, you know, well, tampering. Um, tampering can often occur when injection occurs. Like let's say you have PHP or SQL injection that can have data tampering, right? Or let's say you have um, a security misconfiguration where you thought that a certain patch was taking care of something, but then it did not. And then this led to certain ports being open. And so then that misconfiguration led to an attacker being able to come in um, a much higher threat level um, and they were, the attacker was then able to elevate their privileges. So you can kind of go through different ways things can go wrong and categorize those threats. So that's one example of, mod of modeling. Um, with a lot of these, you'd also be, of course, then be doing um, vulnerability scans um, and you'd want to have asset management with knowing what different things you have in your systems too. A very different model, and the three models I'll be going to, through are all very different from each other. A very different model is called the PASTA threat model. So STRIDE does categorization of threats. PASTA takes an integrated approach where 
you're going through what type of simulations could occur. And it's essentially like you're, you're thinking through almost like a war room strategy. Okay, what is our scope? What's our business strategy? Um, how are we gonna detect different vulnerabilities? What threat intelligence exists out there? Um, and so then within these seven stages, you know, the sixth and the seventh are really where you're getting into the proactive pieces. A lot of it is um, observational um, up to stage five. And so as you model out the attack, you're really thinking from an attacker mindset, what are all the things that can go wrong? How are all the ways our systems could be penetrated? And then what will we do because of that? So what are our proactive measures going to be? How will we fix these things? What risks will we um, mitigate, eliminate, accept? Um, and so this ends up becoming a much more elaborate style. With stages four and five, so here four and five, the threat analysis, they really build on each other. So let's imagine that you gather threat intel on an organization. And this, like it's an enterprise organization. They've had a variety of credential leaks. Um, you know, it's a standard credential leak. Um, it's both a regular exposure, but then also there's some dark web chatter. Okay. So it, not only is it the accounts, but also it is um, that their passwords are some of them are hashed, but some of them are actually in plain text. So it's, it's quite the database for, for this enterprise organization. So how could this be used, right? So if we're doing threat analysis based on threat intelligence, we're gonna be looking at where is this being mentioned? Are these first time mentions? How might they be used? Um, are these active and current employees of this organization? And are any of these credential leaks, upper level management, C-suite level? So all of these things are pieces of threat intelligence that would be taken into account as one is building up the analysis. Those credential leaks could be used with one of the OWASP top 10, the identification and authentication failures, because they could be used for various attacks. It could be used for um, brute forcing. Um, they could be used just for regular logging in um, for the accounts. Um, so that could be one way that the credential leaks are used. They could be used once one is in the system um, for privilege escalation as well. So the Colonial Pipeline was through a VPN um, access account um, from, through VPN login um, from a credential leak. In stage five, we also then might do a vulnerability scan. And we might see um, that our system scan shows us that we have um, certain ports that are open that we might not want open. Uh, maybe we have remote desktop open um, just across the board for a variety of employees, regardless if they need this or not. Um, and so we're kind of thinking through, okay, well, we might want to close some of these remote desktop access port um, places. So we can think through is we gain information, right? So we gain information about these credential leaks. We gain information that there is a vulnerable component. Um, maybe there's a patch that happens and then that leads to a further security misconfiguration. 
All of this is going to be used to paint a very elaborate picture about this organization, which will then be used to develop the countermeasures. And then the third model that I'll discuss today is the diamond threat model. And so you can think actually about a series of diamonds that can be attached to each other. And with this model, you can choose to have different centered approaches. A lot of people take the victim centered approach where they think about like, okay, these were different places that recently had attacks and this could be a focus that we'll take, but you could take any of these approaches. So if we were to take the victim approach and we looked at the Scottish EPA and then maybe a couple different international luxury jewelers and we saw, you know, what, what do these places have in common? Oh, they were both recently um, within the last year um, victims of the same adversary, a ransomware as a service game. And we can see, okay, this adversary has, oh, sorry, let me go back one slide. This adversary has a certain infrastructure. Um, it has command and control servers. It has affiliate hackers. It has its own ransomware that it's built, um, botnets. And one of the systems that it's using for um, a lot of access is it's using remote desktop ports, um, which we can kind of think about how that might have gone up also during work from home. Um, and one of these victims in particular, I do recommend taking a look at the way they approach this. So another thing with the centered approach you can see for looking at trend analysis is, you know, other factors of commonality. So SIPA, the Scottish EPA was attacked at a holiday and their entry access point um, was through remote desktop um, and then privilege escalation. And then they have had four studies commissioned on that attack. And then they publicly shared that data. So they've said, you know, we learned a lot from this attack. We want to make sure that the security community also learns a lot from this attack. And so they've, it's a little bit redacted, but quite a bit um, is not redacted from it. Um, so that is a really interesting one to kind of pay attention to. So those are three models. And then as we're thinking through, big picture. We want to make sure we've created a model. We've identified threats. We've addressed different threats. We want to communicate everything that we've done with all of these things. And then we want to make sure that all of the things that we've done are validated. So I'll go through those fairly quickly. So our first three, as we create the model, we are thinking about scope, we're thinking about what could go wrong. We're thinking about what are the different systems that we're gonna be looking at? What problems are we going to be trying to threat model? As we identify, we're going to be figuring out what tools are we using as well? Um, what intelligence are we gathering? And then we will figure out addressing our threats and we'll share out our findings, just like I was referencing earlier with the Scottish EPA, sharing out those findings. And that might be internal, of course. Um, so there might be a purely internal or there could be an external component to it or a combination of the two. And then we'll need to look through, did what we thought was going to happen happen or should we be doing something differently? So as we create the model, 
it is really important to think through what and who are on the team. How much time is there to do this? Who's on the team? And that's going to determine a lot of different things for how the whole threat modeling process is planned out. So these are a couple different examples for this. We could think about, is it something that's new or is it a subcomponent or is it an existing process? And just like how I started broad and then we're becoming more and more narrow, it's the same thing with this. You can start broad and then focus. Then we would want to identify the threats. So what can go wrong? It goes back to those earlier four questions we're asking. So having a variety of people on your team uh, is very important and it requires a good mix of security knowledge, deep understanding of the information being threat modeled. Now, there are many different tools and methodologies for finding threats. And so that's one of the parts that you'll work on with scope as well. And then this can be you know, a fairly enjoyable part of the whole process as well, because it's like kind of like poking at the whole system, like, oh, what are the ways that this could go, this could go wrong, um, but for a proactive manner. So as you've then figured out, hey, these are the threats, this is what we've learned, you then need to address them. You learned these are these are all the things. And hopefully, hopefully you did figure out these are all the things. Um, and so you need to decide if you'll eliminate, mitigate, transfer, or accept those. Um, and so if you do not threat model something, I think this is probably one of the most important things within this. If you do not threat model something, you by default accept that threat. So that's going to be really important to think through. So even if it's something that you didn't think of, it is then a threat that you've accepted. As you go are going through how you gathered your threats, what you did with them, what processes you took, that's where you want to have documentation. And the documentation is going to very much so tie in with your communication, right? Because you're going to see what actions you took or non-actions how you prioritize things. And then this is also going to help with that teamwork that I spoke about earlier. And so you'll want to have a system that you're using for tracking that. So as you've documented things, you'll then want to communicate, aha, this is what we did. We found these things, we did these things. Who needs to know about everything you did, right? So who are your key stakeholders? Who are the people you need to share out your findings? What is the best way to share that? And of course, then go ahead and do that. And then should you be sharing it out with the whole community? Is it something that the security community would benefit from learning about? So all these things are very important to think through. Now, our last stage is validating the model. And this is so important because you have to measure, did you actually do the things you thought you were going to do? Did you stay within scope or did it have scope creep? <laughs> If it had scope creep, why? What about the criticality? Were the right people involved? And did you need to support other teams? Did you find enough threats? Was there a range of threats for severity and type? Did you kind of see different things with third parties or see threats that were visible and actionable and allowed for team members to be accountable? And did you check in with subject matter experts? So as you're working through this, did you then act on those threats that you found? I've already walked through those four different things you can do. And as you're documenting, did you prioritize and act on those in a timely manner and figure out did those mitigations work? And are you validating the mitigations? And this is my last question that I really like this one. Did any mitigations introduce new threats? Because you need to be very cognizant that certain things you do can also then introduce new threats. So very iterative, right? 
So as you're validating that model, then you'll learn certain things that will end up being circled back to from a communication standpoint as well. So finally, do you kind of have these acceptance criteria? Do you have as an organization ways that you plan out and do you work on things with your team um, it, where you have different maturity levels? So all of these things are so important to think through from a validation standpoint. And now we've gone through different threat models. We've gone through different ways to do threat modeling. And we've gone through very broad to very specific, right? We did three different threat models and we just did like how to process that. We're gonna actually do some practice and I will stop screen sharing because Uma will take it over and lead us through a practice. All right. Oh, thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. Let's see. Can you guys see my screen now? All right. Thank you. Um, now that you have learned five stages of uh, threat modeling that Megan walked uh, you through, uh, let's put that into practice. Let's take an example. All right. Let's take a building system for a company that we want to threat model. So this application building system accepts client transactions and the process them through by applying some rules and send it back to the database for internal use. There is a batch process as well, which actually takes a file uh, from clients uh, that contains all the transactions and um, take them through to the database. And I also want to uh, target the UI portion of this application uh, in scope. This UI, basically what it does is um, the customer or client or external users or even internal users are able to log in and see their transaction they can search for their transactions, they can uh, export to CSV or PDF, and they have also have a facility to reset their password. I also want to focus on admin users here who can create users, um, the client or the internal users as well. So this building system has a lot more to do. But we are going to, for the purpose of this presentation, we are just going to focus on these three, which is what we did uh, on a step one to find our scope. All right. I'm going to go through this architecture. Typically, um, a person who is closer to this application, a team lead or developer will walk you through to everybody who is in that session. So they all have a common understanding of what it is so they can all identify the right threats. So I'm gonna wear my um, developer hat on and I'm gonna walk you through this now. So feel free to find any uh, threats you can come up with and uh, put it on your on our chat window. All right, this application is, as you can see, it is in AWS, hosted in AWS, and it is in a single VPC account. You can see a couple of subnets. The top subnet that you see is um, where external users are logging into UI through HTTPS, and, I, and you can see there is a um, VAF is available. In the middle section where the, sub, the, the middle subnet is, you have UI component, uh, application component, and also a couple of APIs. That does uh, some processing, whatever rules you have set it up uh, to, to process those transactions or any action the users took on the screen, you would have to process those. So it all happening in the middle subnet. And once it's done, it sends off the data to RDS or retrieves the data back uh, from RDS to the web UI. The RDS database itself is in separate subnet. Then up at the bottom, you see there is a, um, another subnet where the external files um, that the client sends are uh, put in an S3 bucket. And there is a Lambda function which takes the data and process it through and send it back to RDS for any internal processing or any other internal system to consume that data. So I'm gonna check off my developer head. I, I hope everybody has a common understanding. 
Um, now I'm going to go back to look at what can go wrong here. So we are going to play what Megan just walks us through. Before we go there, I want to, um, rec I recommend gamifying this. What I mean by that is um, split into a couple of teams and uh, see if you can score, if somebody, some team finds out the good threat and uh, someone comes up with um, some controls or medication or a mediation uh, control in place, you know, score them. Uh, try to have uh, a, a, a game within, within the team itself and see who gets what and, you know, who can uh, um, get a high score. Not only um, this this develop the team uh, the, the team development here, um, but also at the end of the day, you are finding the threats, and also it makes everybody with in, in the session are able to participate and attend and comes up with the, uh, comes up with the threat that they can come up with and breaks that barrier um, of uh, you know openly talking about what could go wrong here. So highly highly gamify this. And uh, we are going to be using the framework um, straight, not past our diamond that uh, Megan walked, walked us through, but we are going to use uh, stride. Just to recap what stride is, uh, stride is basically uh, spoofing, tampering, um, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and uh, elevation of privilege is what we are going to use that as a format and identify those uh, threats here. One thing I want to note it down here is I want to acknowledge the fact that um, this application has a solid segmentation, um, which has uh, multiple subnets uh, that reduces the landscape, uh, threat landscape here, or attack surface, you can call it. Um, so it's a really good segmentation. And, uh, um, and not only the segmentation, it also has uh, its own security. Each component has its own security group, which is great. So let's go into identifying some threats here. Hopefully you would catch what I'm going through. By no means it's all complete. Um, I'm sure we can find a lot, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna stick with a couple of them. Malicious file sent. Um, this is the case of tampering, where you would, uh, somebody would tamper uh, the, you know, get access to, to, to the, uh, the location and change the file, uh, probably the data within the file, or change the entire file itself. If you are looking at or expecting CSV file, it could just send you JPEG with the bad code in it. That could be devastating if that uh, uh, vulnerable if that threat um, exploits the vulnerability that we have. Other one I can think of is again this is uh, the element of spoofing will come into picture where uh, an attacker can uh, act as a spoof as a uh, valid user can get onto the UI and navigate through and get the data exploit the data or do some damage to the system. Data security that goes with information disclosure is a big thing uh, since this is an billing application. Um, obviously, you would have some NPA data. Uh, you have to make sure they are all protected. Developer rotation. This is oftentimes um, not looked at. So that's why I wanted to bring it here. Elevation of privilege element is in picture here. Um, the smaller organization uh, sometimes, most of the time, they have shared developer resources where they would work on this project and then they move on to the next project. When they do, it is very critical. It is important to make sure the access control is cut off if not necessary. Um, very critical here. The same goes with the access control. Uh, that's part of uh, elevation of privilege where uh, an admin user uh, should not have access to update a transaction or upload a file. So that need to know at least a privilege, uh, the fundamental of best of practices should, should be followed here. So that could be one of the threats. AppSec finding, uh, this would um, tick off all the elements of stride, um, depends on the vulnerability that you can find on the database or you can find on the web UI or even um, on the API itself. So you do have to see what vulnerability does, how your patch management will look like. Um, it's very critical here. There's one uh, example I wanted to provide for denial of service. 
What if, if an attacker sends you thousands of files, wherein your Lambda function is designed or expecting to do only one file at a time? This will bring down your entire system. You're not able to uh, process the actual real file, which, which means your availability of the system would be gone. So you have to think through all of those elements and see what can go wrong. Again, this is not a complete list. There are a lot more we can come up with, but I'm just limiting for this, uh, for this webinar here. Um, once you find those threads, you have to document them, kind of risk register, I would call, um, and uh, see whatever tool of your choice, um, according to your organization, you would, um, you, would, you would register them, you would document them. Um, here, the risk you see here is, I have mentioned this high. This is before you, before you uh, uh, add any context or before you know what kind of mitigation control you have in place. Um, so it's now came up with a high, you would document to whatever we have found now. Then I want to go back into, the next step would be you have to go deep dive into each one of them and see how you want to address this, right? So let's take one example here, um, which is, you know, malicious file upload. Uh, would cause an insecure deserialization attack if it's not, if you don't have the right control in. You will have to find out, okay, what control we have now? Um, mitigating control or compensating control? What do we do here in order to, in order to, uh, comp in order to bring the risk level to uh, low? So once, if you have, say, for example, SSO MFA, only trusted resource can be deserialized. Um, but then your risk level could go back to medium. In that case, um, you can open up a backlog story and um, and then you know get it prioritized. But if your threat level is still a high or critical, uh, the step four of communicating is very critical here. You have to let your leadership know that you have this vulnerability high and critical, and they can help you prioritize them. So the recommendations here via the scan, obviously file size check. Um, if you have, if you are expecting 10 gig and uh, the file size is 100 gig, you have to make sure um, you are uh, you have some controls to test that. And uh, privileged user access should be monitored. Like admin admin user should not be able to go back and and update the data. One more example I want to give you here. Um, I would like to see the uh, time. I want to make sure we are cognizant of time here. All right. So one example here, I want to take it. This is the example where you would accept the risk um, in that way. Uh, I wanted to show you this example where you can accept it. I'm going to pass for a second here. Why this is a threat? Let me know what do you think this could be a threat for the organization? Okay. Um, I'm going to come up with this. This is what I came up with. Um, by allowing the report locations means that any sensitive data can be visible to your friends and families of employee. This directly goes to the element of stride. So you will have you will have to find out what medication control you have or compensating control you already have, and which will reduce your risk rating to uh, the low um, if you have those controls in place. So, for example, you don't have to show all sensitive information in every screen. You can mask them. You show them only when it is absolutely needed. That's one of the control you can implement if you don't have it. Uh, on a compensated control, obviously, you can recommend a privacy screen. You can give them a mandatory CBT where uh, the employees goes through and uh, see how they can work from home safe and secure. Um, obviously, you can do a background check on employees. So the recommendation I come up with is, you know, document the threat for visibility, of course, and then continue to monitor for any anti-patterns. So going back to the documentation, now the risk is reduced to a medium for the first example that we walked us through. You will go into uh, each one of them and do the same exercise on what you will do, what kind of story it is going to create for you, how you can prioritize them. So we have done a step one to four, um, and now this part, validation part, is really, really critical. 
uh, the reason is, you know, did you cover the right component? You have to make sure you're not covering, you are covering the right component so that, um, you know, it makes sense and sense for that session. Uh, and did you have all uh, level of uh, skill set in that session? Do you have extended team come on board and attend the session to uh, go with, go through this exercise with you? Did you find enough threads? Most importantly, did you find the right threads? It's very critical. And also I have to make sure the threads that are identified are visible and actionable. Are you acting on the threads that you have found? Um, I like the example of what, what Megan said, you know, that she's trusted on. If you have acted on a threat, did it introduce any new threat? Um, that has to be, uh, you know, looked at and then had to be documented as well. And uh, is the approach to threat modeling working? Uh, what I mean by that is, um, you know, there are ways to uh, validate if this approach is working or not. For example, pen testing. Um, if you have a lesser number of uh, findings, that's uh, that's one way to see if this approach is working for you. Secondly, you do, um, uh, and also you have to make sure that uh, uh, this, this approach, you know, that the pen testing is less, and also have to make sure that uh, um, the uh, your DevSec, DevSec off cycle um, is lesser now. So all of things, all of those metrics will tell you if this approach is working or not for you. All right. Um, so the, here are the recap, to recap, here are the five steps of threat modeling, create the model, identify the threats, address the threats, communicate the results, and validate it. Now that, um, go back to the example we, uh, we started out with, you know, going for a walk and things you would do, right? Uh, now that you know all these five steps of threat modeling, um, apply them, apply them into uh, everyday, uh, you know, development life cycle to make sure that if that it's a future or it, it, it's a component or a new initiative, um, you would have to apply them. Go back to uh, that example I provided before. And um, go simple, don't overthink it, go broad as you can. There is no one way or one right way to do this. Um, and introduce now, there's one thing if you have to take it away from this presentation, I this would be it. Introduce the threat modeling to uh, your development team and read the benefit of uh, threat modeling. Th with that, I conclude our presentation. And here are the references so that you can use. And um, here's our contact information. Uh, we can uh, uh, we can be available on the LinkedIn and uh, Megan can be contacted on Twitter as well. Now we are ready for Q&A.